So I need to wear it, yeah. Yep. So I use your restroom or yep. You should be all right. Slides, are you seeing that? He has to switch back and forth. Okay, go ahead. So you just want to put that in your pocket or yeah. in your Okay. Yes, thank you very much, sir. So, so. The teleprompter. Did you see the guy it was like a lottery pick? Just I hope he doesn't go to the Sixers. <laughs> Just so long as he doesn't go to the Sixers. I want people to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Your boys got the first pick <sighs> after Sam Hankey. Isn't, isn't that something? If you can feed my meter at some point. They both will be fine.
Welcome, everyone. I'm Stuart Ellis, President and CEO of Charter School Capital. Thank you very much for joining us today. We are excited to bring you uh, today's event, the first in a series of events Charter School Capital uh, is bringing to you uh, today regarding Play Matters. Um, this series will include uh, three other sessions following this regarding storytelling, expect the unexpected, and got grit. Um, we're honored to have Kevin Carroll with us today. Uh, I'll touch on uh, Kevin in a moment about uh, all the things he brings and, and how happy we are to have him here. But I uh, wanted to let you know that Charter School Capital, as most of you are aware, is the only provider of both growth capital and facilities financing options specifically designed for charter schools. It's all we've ever done and all we do. Uh, is fun charter schools. We believe in the power of a charter school education uh, and therefore we are expanding the knowledge offerings that we are providing to charter leaders around the country um, with this live webcast as the newest addition to the wealth of information and knowledge that you can find on our website, on our blog, and across social media. Um, as part of the things we've done uh, since our founding nearly a decade ago, uh, we have now funded more than 500 charter schools across the country, invested well over a billion dollars in your operations, and uh, support over 550,000 charter school students. Um, we're excited to participate in the educations uh, and academic performance that you all provide. Um, and today, uh, we're, we're particularly happy to have Kevin Carroll with us. Uh, he's going to talk about play, why that matters, um, and uh, particularly in why it matters in educating children today. Kevin is an advocate for play. He's made his life about play. Um, he's a speaker, author, partner, and uh, most importantly, a friend. <laughs> um, we welcome Kevin today. Hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Uh, if you have any questions as you go through things, uh, Please ask them in the YouTube live chat area, and then uh, the material today will be available after the fact uh, for download link or viewing uh, separately if you find uh, the information and presentation of it uh, exciting and want to share it with others. So thank you again. Uh, without further ado, here's Kevin Carroll. At this point, there should be loud applause. Yes, brilliant, brilliant. So, welcome everyone. I'm thrilled to be here and get an opportunity to share some information with you. I brought a little bit of eye candy, as you could see. So, we're going to have an interactive and fun time. One of the things that I want each and every one of us to think about is the role and value of play, but even more so within an education setting. And Charter School Capital, I'm so thrilled to be a part of their organization and this partnership, this creative collaboration, and for them to entrust you all with me. And I think that as we start to share these conversations, each of the webinars that we're going to do, I think it's fitting with this being National Charter School Week and this great opportunity for us to elevate the conversation with you all, that we should be celebrating something that is fundamental to growth and learning and even more so maximizing our human potential, play. Play is serious business, and play matters. And so that's what I'm going to share with you all today. It's a conversation about that. I'll share a bit about my story, my personal background, and why play matters to me, how play has affected me and advanced my journey and my, I, I, my journey from success to significance. I think that's probably the best way to put that. And even more so why you all should be thinking about how to inject more play into the school setting and why play can assist with abstract thinking, ingenuity, problem solving, collaboration, better school and classroom environment, and even more so how you communicate best, how you problem solve, how you actually solve a conflict. All these things can happen through play. So. Without further ado, I'm going to take you through my story, and then we'll move on from there. And I have lots of different things that I'll relate to and use as examples. And then I have some videos that I'm going to share with you all. So if that's all fair and we're all good, game on. Here we go. So this is a beautiful quote. You can discover more about a person in one hour of play than in a year of conversation. Plato. 
You absolutely can. You can discover more about a person in one hour of play than in a year of conversation. So if we stop and think about that, the importance of that, one of the things that I want you all to understand is my journey. Now, my journey involves lots of different twists and turns and things, but I had to make a lot of choices at a very early age. And one of the challenges that I faced was both my parents were addicts, and they made a lot of bad decisions that affected three little boys. My father left when I was three, and I never saw him again. My mother, she left us when I was six, and she left us in a predicament. We were abandoned in a trailer over 200 miles away from the city that we were living in, Philadelphia, and we had no food, no money, and we didn't know where we were. So one of the challenges was, how are we going to get out of this predicament? Well, I remember my grandfather's phone number. He had actually practiced with us that phone number till we rem memorized it. My brother and I had learned that. And so I remembered the phone number, and I sought out a stranger with my brothers following behind. We found a stranger, told the stranger our predicament, would you please call my grandfather? So he dialed the number. One thing led to another. Next thing we know, we're being whisked away to the Greyhound bus station in Bowling Green, Virginia placed on the bus with the bus driver actually watching over us, going 200 miles away at the ages of eight. I was six, and my little brother was three, my older brother was eight. Now can you imagine how terrifying that would be for a child? But yet I knew that something was important and lying ahead for me, and it was safety and security. It was my grandparents' home, but even more so, that community that I remembered was really nurturing and absolutely uplifting, and I wanted to get back to that. And most importantly, I wanted to get back to school because our mother had taken us out of school. So it was really important that I got a chance to go back to school. And so one of the things that I started to understand really quickly in the neighborhood was that a ball could change my life. And so in the neighborhood, sports was a really important thing. Play was a really important thing. Our neighborhood had a playground. That playground was the epicenter of the neighborhood, the energy center. Preston Playground. Now, Preston Playground was an amazing place because everyone came through that playground. Every individual cut through there because it was this main tributary in the neighborhood. So as I started to understand this place and its importance, but even more so how it affected me and how it affected my life, I could have never, ever dreamt that it was going to be a turning point and a catalyst in my life. And so as I started to understand more and more about the importance of this ball, I started to understand what it could do for me. See, play saved my life, and a ball saved my life. If it wasn't for Preston Playground, I don't think I'd be in front of you all right here right now. Now, the social workers came and checked on us. They talked to my grandparents, and I loved sitting on the top of the steps and overhearing these conversations. And many times they said the same thing. Mr. and Mrs. Carroll, don't expect much. Just do the best you can, but look at the background that the boys come from. Just do the best you can. I would sit at the top of the steps, and I would say, I'll show you. You watch. I'm going to show you. And I started to commit myself to something, play. I realized that in that commitment and that recommitment, day after day after day, that it was affecting me. It was advancing me, and it was allowing me to rise above my circumstances. It was assisting me in discovering that my circumstances didn't have to dictate my destiny. So the more that I started to understand the role and value of play, the more I dove into play. And I played lots of, of games, but it was more about connecting. It was more about belonging. It was about being a part of something, because it was really familial for me, because I didn't have a sense of family, a sense of belonging. So the more that I started to connect and participate in sports, the more I started to understand how powerful this icon, this ball, could be. So there's this beautiful quote from W.N. Murray from the Scottish Himalayan Expedition, and he talks about commitment in this way. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. The moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur that would otherwise never have occurred. A whole stream of events Issues from that one decision, raising in one's favor, all manner of unforeseen incidents, meetings, and material assistance, which no one could have ever dreamt, would come their way. Now think about that again. All manner of unforeseen incidents, meetings, and material assistance came to someone's aid because of that commitment. And that's my story. With that recommitment, day after day after day, and connecting with people, I got things that people said were never going to happen for me. Those social workers were proven wrong, but it was because of this ball initially. And so I played lots of sports, but I didn't play sports for the purpose of 
really first place a trophy or a medal. It was always about belonging and connecting. So here are some examples of the games that I played. So this is our fifth and sixth grade football team from Coopertown Elementary School. And one of the things that I started to understand about my teams is that I was a little small. I learned the word diminutive when I was in third grade, and it really actually affected my language, right, and my love of language. And so when I learned diminutive, I shifted everything. So in that image, you got a chance to see my fifth and sixth grade football team, but even more so, if we can go back to the image, it would be great. I want to point out the disparity in the height of me and my brother. So my older brother, Donnie's in the back row there. He's number 49, and I'm number 55 circled there. We're only a year apart in age. Can you imagine that difference there, right? So one of the things you need to also understand is my brothers and I are very different in the way that we look. My older brother, Donnie, is over six feet tall. My younger brother, Kyle, is over six feet tall, over 220 plus pounds, full beards, chest, back hair. They can do the whole thing. I barely shaved in the same height and weight since high school, so I'm not really sure what happened. I got a different set of genes. So as we start to understand all the sports, here's an image of me playing soccer. I ran track, ice hockey, lacrosse, basketball, you name it. I played it, but it was always about connecting, always about belonging, but even more so about community. It was an eclectic, crazy community of people who assisted me in rising above my circumstances, from drug dealers to drug users, from alcoholics to winos, from professional people to the parents of my friends, from custodians to librarians, school teachers, you name it, I was seeking out wisdom from everyone. This community of people actually uplifted me and my brothers. They all tried to find a way to support us, and all three of us did fine. Both my brothers found their success. My older brother Donnie is retired Navy, 22 years, lives in Alabama. My younger brother Kyle, he's an IT specialist in South Dakota. But then my journey took on a very different trajectory. So the next thing that happened, and this slide will be great for you all to see because I got a great image that I'm going to share with you, but reading books makes you better. See, I started to discover this because I got my public library card at nine years old. And the first book that I ever checked out, and I know you're going to want to see this, everybody remembers this book. Where the Wild Things Are. Come on, don't act like you don't know about this book. This book is amazing. And one of the things I have to tell you is this book set me off. This book actually, I think, really was the spark for my creative energy. This book was really phenomenal to me in so many levels, and I started to really love reading. I've had a public library card in every single city that I've lived in from that time at nine years old. And I know reading books makes you better. And I started to understand the role and value of education. So the ball came into my life, books come into my life, and then something really magical actually happens. And you all need to understand that peanut butter and jelly is also very important in my life. But peanut butter and jelly is important for a different reason, not the one that you would think. So imagine a new kid comes in the neighborhood. They decide that the rules have changed. They don't just simply welcome you like they did when I was six. Now they want to see if you're a tough guy. So they size up the new kid and I, and they decide that Norman Lane's got to fight me. So I don't want to fight him. He doesn't want to fight me. They egg us on, and they say, if you two don't fight, we're going to beat you both up. I'm like, that's not very fair. Norman said, it's OK. And we end up having this pugilistic moment that wasn't really amazing. But the peace offering that Norman presented to me was, do you want to come to my house for peanut butter and jelly? So we walk to his house, all covered in dirt, and I meet his family. And one of the things that I want you all to understand is that a 46-year-long friendship came from that moment, that fight. But it wasn't with Norman. It was with his mother, Miss Lane. Now, you need to understand this about Miss Lane. She was my CEO. Miss Lane just passed away two years ago at 83. For 46 years, we had an amazing friendship. For 46 years, Ms. Lane became this amazing encourager in my life. I like to call her my CEO, my chief encouragement officer of my dreams. Ms. Lane understood that it was important for me to see possibilities, so she did it in a very simple way. She offered me permission to dream big with two very simple words. Why not? Miss Lane, Miss Lane, I'm thinking about the cello, and they got the school music program, so I'm thinking about trying the cello. Why not? Miss Lane, Miss Lane, I'm thinking that it might be great to uh, do the Shakespeare play. Why not? Miss Lane, Miss Lane, every time I had a crazy, fanciful, ridiculous idea, Miss Lane would always say, why not? But the next piece was, what are you going to do with that idea? I'm going to check back. I learned about accountability at nine years old. I started to understand the importance of not talking about it, but being about it. There's a beautiful quote 
The distance between a dream and reality is called action. It's called action. I have my own personal hashtag. It's GSD, get stuff done. Now, if we were not having this G-rated show, it would be the PG slash R-rated. You know what the S stands for, but get stuff done is what I'm about. Every single day, advancing an idea. The distance between a dream and reality is called action. And Miss Lane taught me that. She taught me about accountability and that you needed to follow up. So the more that I started to understand all these things, they all resulted in something really amazing for me, something that no one could have ever thought was going to happen. Can we go to the next slide? So one of the things that I started to understand was turning ideas into reality. That's what I learned from all these things, from the ball allowing me to connect and belong, from books allowing me to celebrate my love of learning and reading books and education, and then a community. Miss Lane and all that eclectic people that helped to support me helped me turn ideas into reality. And one of the things that I started to understand was that I could do a lot with my background. It didn't matter. Like those circumstances didn't have to dictate my destiny. So I spent 10 years in the Air Force as a language translator where I learned five languages. I speak Serbian, Croatian, Russian, German, and Czech. I got an opportunity in the Air Force to do lots of different things, get my bachelor's degree and get my master's degree in health education and physical education. And then I was an athletic trainer at the high school level, the collegiate level, and then I landed my dream job with the Philadelphia 76ers, by the way, who got the number one pick. I'm not really celebrating it, but I'm just putting that out there that they got the number one pick. I'm hoping they're going to be a lot better than they are in the past few seasons, but I was the third African-American head athletic trainer in the history of the NBA for my hometown team, the Philadelphia 76ers. And who knew that that was going to create other opportunities for me? That that moment with the 76ers and a chance moment with an NBA player would create a different trajectory for me, a different journey. So one of the things that was happening during my time at the 76ers was we were in the middle of a game. There was a player, some of you might know his name, Vlade Divac. If you're not familiar with his name, Vlade Divac, he's from the former Yugoslavia, seven feet tall, played in the NBA for a long time, had a really great career. So one of the things I want you to understand is he's in the zone, talking trash when we're playing against his team. He's playing for the Charlotte Hornets, the Hornets at the time. So one of the things that my coach is getting upset with is that we can't stop this guy. We don't want to use timeouts. So he starts kind of masterminding another way to stop this guy. So he's yelling at me about the timeout situation. I'm telling him how many timeouts we have. We have two timeouts. He doesn't want to use a timeout. He comes up with this crazy idea. He's staring at this seven-foot-tall man running up and down the court, talking trash to our bench. And he looks at me, and he looks back at this seven-foot-tall man, and you could see the light bulb actually pop up on his head, right? And he goes, Carol, don't you speak that big guy's language? And I'm like, yeah, coach. Just, okay, okay, okay. He'll never expect this from you. Say something about his mom or dad or sister or brother when he runs by the bench and try to distract him. Like, why would I do that? So we're in the middle of an NBA basketball game having an argument about me insulting a seven-foot-tall man in his native language, and I don't want to do it, but the coach wants to find a better defense and not use timeouts. So can you imagine this, <laughs> this conflict going on in the middle of the game? So I relent. I finally surrendered to his request, and I start insulting this seven-foot-tall man in his native language, Serbian. So now, mind you, I can tell your mama jokes in Serbian and Croatian and Czech that crush you. So I start saying about your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother. By the fifth time that I've insulted Vlade Divac, he stops in the middle of an NBA basketball game, storms towards our bench, screaming, who's insulting my family in Serbia? And the coach was that little guy right over there. And I'm looking at him. I'm looking up at this seven-foot-tall man. I'm like, dobar dan, kako ste vi gospodine? He's just dumbfounded. So the whole rest of the game, he can't make a shot, can't really function properly. The coach is thrilled. He's high-fiving me. Great job, Carol. And Vladi is not pleased. He comes storming into our locker room after the game looking for me. Where is that little guy at? Where is that little guy at? Everybody's like telling on me, he's back there, he's back there, he's back there. And then the unexpected happens. Hey, you, because it would be like that. He was seven feet tall. Hey, you, never thought I'd meet a you. The Yugoslavian national basketball team has qualified for the 96 Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia. We're looking for a sports medicine liaison and a translator. You're perfect. Can you imagine, right, that, that I'm thinking the worst is going to happen, that this man is probably going to lift me up off my feet and scream at me. And he invites me to join his national basketball team at the 96 Olympic Games in Atlanta. And I support them. And that turns into something that no one could have ever anticipated, an opportunity to join this organization, Nike. 
Now, I didn't anticipate this, but the NBA did a special story about me, and it created this energy around my gifts and talents. And someone from Nike happens to see this story that the NBA did, and I get a phone call out of the blue from Nike. They want to hire me. They basically say, we don't have a job title, we don't have a functionary, we're not really sure where you're going to work, but you know what? We think you can add value to this company. Would you take a risk? So at this point, I'm a single father. I raised my two boys on my own. I have two sitters that I'm juggling. Now, I'm not really sure how to manage all this, so I have a lot of help, a lot, once again, of community of people supporting me. But when I go on the road with this MBA team and the big kids, I come back and my kids didn't have me. There's an A on the refrigerator, a trophy on the mantle, but I wasn't there. So in my own way, I feel like I'm an absent father like my dad was, and I don't like that feeling, so I make a big decision. I take Nike up on their offer. I move out to Portland, Oregon. This is what you're seeing on my hat here, the P, right? It's for Portland and for Philly, and really close detail, there is the state of Oregon within that. So I went from Philly to Oregon, and here I am in 1997, and I start at Nike, and I get to create my own position, my own role, and I come up with Creative Catalyst, the catalyst with a K because of Kevin, and that's my role for seven years. A catalyst, if you remember, and I know there's some people out there that teach science, so you do remember the definition of a catalyst, an excitatory agent that speeds up or changes the process. Help others turn ideas into reality really was my goal. What I really was doing, though, was recreating Preston Playground, an entity, an environment, a locale, a destination that was inviting and welcoming and about connecting. Each and every one of us started to understand that it wasn't about excluding anyone. It was always about including and inviting and welcoming people. So I did the same thing at Nike. I got a chance to do that for seven years. I worked all over the company and got an opportunity to affect a lot of different things. But one of my, as they like to call it, Nike moments, is I got 3,000 people to play tag. Yes, 3,000 people to play tag. And the reason I did that was I didn't think we were having enough fun. I thought we needed to have more fun. And we're in the business of play and sports. Why aren't we having more fun? So it started off really innocently and grew into this opportunity for the entire organization. And the reason that I was actually pushing it was that I started to do some research. I started to discover that play is serious business, that play is serious in the business of ingenuity, problem solving, innovation, abstract thinking, creativity. And I started really espousing that and talking to people more and more about that. And the more they started hearing my words and what I was sharing, they got enthused and excited. And then I just threw it out there. I was like, you know what? We should play tag. And they go, what? I said, yeah, in fact, we should get everybody to play tag. And so we organized it. 3,000 people, three hours, we played tag. And it was so inspiring. Our advertising agency, Wyden and Kennedy, wanted me to come and share what we were doing at the campus at Nike. And so I started telling them about the research that I had done around play, what I saw happen with the tag game. And they said, you know what? I think we're going to do a campaign. So I thought I'd share with you all a little video right now of one of the top ads in the world that came from this whole play campaign that Wyden and Kennedy created. And one of the things I want you all to understand is, how can you actually inject moments of play in your community, in your school, and its role and value, and even more so that play is serious business. Enjoy.
So, what do you think? An entire community at play, the opportunity to galvanize an organization, to bring together the environment, to bring together the community. I'll say it once again, play is serious business. Some amazing play advocates out there, I'll talk about them a little later, but Playworks is fantastic. Kaboom is fantastic. They do wonderful work around creating safe places to play and creating safe environments and moments for play. And so I'll talk a little bit more about them as we move forward. So at Nike, for seven years, I got an opportunity to participate in that organization as a catalyst, a creative catalyst, an excitatory agent that speeds up or changes the process. I helped others turn ideas into reality. One of the most important things I started to understand is being inviting and welcoming and supportive and creating this community of like-minded people. So the more that I started to understand the role and value of play and its importance to that, one of the things that I started to talk about was really finding a way to bring play around the world. So I had this idea. Can a ball change the world? Can a ball affect others? So taking that research around you know, Plato's quote, the importance of play, its role and value around innovation, creativity, problem solving, abstract thinking, ingenuity, all those things, I started to do research. I started to collect ideas around play. And I started to go around the world. And so I want to share with you all some of my travels. And so this is actually what I like to say is, oh, the places you'll go box. And so this, these are some of the examples of the places that I've been and the places that I've gone. And literally, I only grabbed just a few examples to uh, share with you all today. But just suffice it to say that I have been around the world quite a bit but I've actually been able to witness play all over the world. And so some of the places that I've had a chance to travel, I'd like for you all to see with the slides. And so we've been to places like Uganda, been to places like India, been to places like the Northern Territory, the outback, the top end of Australia. And I have a ball collection from all over the world that I want you all to see some of the images. This is a ball from Indonesia made out of wicker. This is a water balloon ball from Mexico a ball made of socks from Brazil. This is a trash bag ball from Kenya. The kids had no strings, so they actually made string out of tire rubber from an old tire. Trash bag ball from Mozambique. And this one, I say, is the most ingenious of the collection. This is made out of fibers from a tree in Uganda. When the game is over, you always know, because that ball disintegrates. It disappears. It's gone. I love the fact that when it waterproof that, you put it in a plastic bag, and you simply tie it up. So one of the things I want you all to see is I brought a few more examples of my ball collection. So I want to share some of those with you. So this is a phenomenal group. This is One World Play Project. They make a virtually indestructible ball. And they actually take this literally. They've had a lion try to tear this up, elephants stand on it. It's amazing, it's durability. And there's some really harsh environments out there in the world that people are trying to affect play and bring play to communities and to youth and into the education system. So they came up with the idea that we need a ball that doesn't pop. We need a ball that's virtually indestructible. So the One World Play Project is fantastic. And this is the ball that they have. Uh, this is from Melbourne, Australia, actually one of the first in my collection. I got this from um, a, a high school student group, um, the Bialik High School in Melbourne, Australia. They actually shared this with me, and they always, anytime I show this ball, I have to say the same thing, that this grade six beat grade nine with this ball at lunchtime, so they want to make sure that you know that the grade six was better than grade nine with this ball. This was their victory ball. And uh, this is from the Homeless World Cup. When we did this in 2006 in Cape Town, the Homeless World Cup is an amazing soccer tournament that brings marginalized individuals from all over the world. They get a chance to represent their organization, their country, and they get to play a game. But the game is much bigger than that. They're actually changing lives and saving lives. And people have to actually make an agreement to try to get off drugs, to find a home, to use all the resources available to them. And Mel Young created this moment out of necessity, and it has grown into something I think there'll be well over 50 or 60 nations represented in the upcoming um, Homeless World Cup, which will be in Scotland. And he's phenomenal social change agent in the work that he's doing. Oh, let's see, this one. So this is made out of regrind, sock, um, regrind shoes by Nike, and they actually gave this to the UN efforts. 
And this is one of the examples of how you can use, you know, things can have a duality of purpose, have more than one use. So shoes actually got ground up to create this soccer ball that was shared with, via the UN. One of these is really remarkable. Sorry for turning my back, but I got to lift this properly. So this is 23 pounds worth of asparagus bundle rubber bands that were given to me by the chefs in, at the Four Seasons Hotel in Vancouver, British Columbia years ago, literally 23 pounds worth. It took them years and they saved this and they said, Kevin, Kevin, we want to gift this to you. And they hand it to me and literally I dropped out. It was so heavy. So this is just some of the examples of my ball collection and the things that I have. And so I had this idea to bring play around the world. And even more so, what I want to do is join forces join forces with other global game changers. I mentioned a few of them, from Mel Young with the Homeless World Cup to the One World Play Project, to organizations that are actually advocating and supporting play. So Playworks is an amazing organization that started in the Bay Area, is now a national program, and they do remarkable work around recess advocacy. They actually come into your school and assist you with having better recess moments teaching the students how to take ownership of, but even more so, how to manage recess so it's productive. So they bring this great energy back into the classroom, and everyone is uplifted and ready to learn. Now, I know you teachers, you know recess can be this crazy, ridiculous moment where the students come back in, and all the conflicts and issues spill back into the classroom, and the students aren't settled and ready to learn. Imagine an environment where the students go out excited about the, the play experience they're going to have at recess, but even more so enthused and energized to come back and learn from you. So Playworks is really an amazing recess advocacy group. I love doing the work with them and supporting them, and I think they're phenomenal resources. I'm going to share their playbook with all of you post this event. I'm going to have a few resources to send out to you all. So that's part of what I like to do is to make sure that you all receive some of these items or things or insights or tools. And so there will be a few of those things that I'm going to share with you all. That will be one of the most important ones, this playbook from Playworks. Even more so when you stop to think about why we need to be playing Oh, I forgot to share this one with you. So this is all recycled bicycle inner tubes. It's an amazing uh, artist up in Boston. It's called Cycle, C-Y-Q-L. And they act, she actually goes and finds at old bike shops, old inner tubes that are beat up and done, don't hold air, and she repurposes them. And so she creates a ball. and. What's wonderful is it bounces. So it's a lot of fun and great opportunity for you to think about play and sport in a different way. But imagine that you live off the grid. Imagine that you're having a difficult time finding light. You're using kerosene lamps and candles. And it's dangerous. Lots of lives are lost because of that situation. Imagine if you could have play be an instigator, actually a catalyst, to find light so that you could do your homework or cook in the evenings because you're off the power grid. Well, two young ladies actually came up with this idea. They started an organization called Unchartered Play. And what's wonderful, what's wonderful is that program has now become a sustainable business. So I want to share with you all a little video about Socket. Kick a ball, turn on a light. an idea for clean energy that I think it's fair to say hardly anybody else on the planet had ever thought of. It's quite extraordinary, really. Kick a ball, turn on a light. It's an off-grid solution that gives us a way to bring power and improve quality of life, working capacity, learning capacity. So what do you think? Kick a ball? Turn on a light, socket, bam. I'm telling you, isn't that amazing? Can you imagine you come home from school, right? Come into 
your community. Your loved one is saying, you know what, I'm so glad you're home. You know what, take that ball and go get us some light. Get outside and play. So I think it's wonderful. So this is socket. This is it. Kick a ball, turn on a light. An innocent class project has turned into an amazing business where they're actually finding ways to power those who don't have power. And it's through play. So I love the idea of socket. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to start to think about how play can really affect. So these global game changers, these individuals, these organizations that are really affecting and making a difference from Playworks to the One World Play Project to the Homeless World Cup to Beyond Sport, which is a global gathering of thought leaders and social innovators, to Socket. There's so many opportunities for all of us to affect others. As teachers, as educators, as staff members, you're global game changers. See, the impact that you're having on those young people, they're going to go on to do amazing things. They're going to be the next generation of leaders, makers, doers, dreamers, and global game changers. So we're affecting them, so why not think about the impact of play? Not just their studies, but everything that play can do. I'll say it once again, play is serious business, and play is serious in the business of advancing the next generation of leaders, makers, doers, dreamers, and global game changers. So here's some things that I know to be true. One of the things that I think is absolutely a necessity is you got to bring your energy each and every day. You've got to recommit. I shared that quote about commitment, and I'll say it once again. All manner of unforeseen incidents, meetings, and material assistance will appear for you, will come your way if you commit every single day and you bring the requisite energy. You've got to have a positive attitude. right? You can't be bringing in that negative. right? We have to be believers. We can't be haters. We've got to be motivators. right? And I love the, th the fact that I truly believe this. Haters are my motivators. You want to hate on my idea and tell me it's not possible? I'll show you. That's the way I was as a child. That's my daily mantra. I'm going to show you when I was younger, I'd say it that way, but I'll show you. And I think play really matters, that we need to tap into its role and value, not ignore it. Recognize that it is serious business. And so you'll see behind me actually a few images, but I love this one that says, play is necessary, play is a ball, play is a movement, play is ingenuity, Play is timeless, but most importantly, play is genius. If we really tap into play and recognize its role and value to see the competitive advantage that it can give our youth and our next generation of leaders, makers, doers, and dreamers, we won't marginalize it. We'll hold it up. We'll celebrate it. We'll recognize that it should never, ever be just pushed to the side. It should always be celebrated every single day. I'll say it once again, that play is serious business. And play is serious in the business of advancing the next generation. And the more that we as teachers and educators and community and staff recognize that, I'm here to tell you that anything truly is possible. I stand before you living proof of that, that play really can affect a life, that play can save a life, that a ball can change the world. I've given you examples. I don't know many more things that I can exhaust myself and wring out, but I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to listen to your questions, answer those, whatever it is, but I'm here for you. Please know that this partnership with Charter School Capital and me is really important. They're giving me a wonderful platform to speak with you all, to connect with you all, to hopefully inspire you, to do the big work that you're doing. I know it's not easy every day. I know it can be challenging. Listen, I watched Ms. Lane and Mr. Lane, who were school teachers for 30 plus years in Philadelphia School District, I watched them do the big work, the lonely work, the work of a champion. Listen, they don't always get kudos and accolades. I know people don't pat you on the back and say, job well done, but I'm here to tell you that you're affecting a life like mine. Each and every day that you come with that requisite energy, you bring that positivity, you see the potential in a student and not their circumstances, and you inject in them inspiration, possibilities, anything truly is possible. I stand before you living proof that someone can rise above their circumstances, that someone's circumstances do not have to dictate their destiny, and that play can be a catalyst. So James Mishner has a beautiful quote I'd like to share with you all. It really talks about blurring the lines between work and play. The master in the art of living makes little distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his information and his recreation, 
his love and his religion. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence, leaving others to decide whether he is working or playing. See, to him, he's always doing both. And shouldn't that be our quest? To blur the lines between our work and play, find joy and energy and positivity in each of our endeavors? Because listen, your future is getting shorter, and every day that you get the gift of the present, why not maximize that? That's our gift. That's our opportunity. That's my call to action to all of you, is bring a little bit of play. So I'll raise this question. What's your play? What was your favorite form of play as a child? What did you enjoy doing? What was that game that every time they called it out, oh my gosh, I couldn't wait to play that game? So listen, I know mine. Kickball was one. We played it on a tennis court as kids because we actually made it like a stadium. You could kick the ball over the fence, but you could also play the ball outside the fence. So if we knew somebody had a big leg, we'd like, time out, time out. And we'd run outside the fence, and we'd wait for the ball to come over so we could actually play you that way. So kickball. I liked red light, green light. That was another one of my favorites, right? And I liked to play stickball. So those were my three as a child, right? I got a plethora, one of my favorite words, plethora, right, of games that I love and play, but even more so, ask yourself that question. What was my favorite game or games as a child? What's my play now? Don't marginalize it. Celebrate it. Each and every one of us, the more that we start to understand that play is serious business and elevate that in our own lives first, but then share it with others, tap into all the resources that are available, make sure we're injecting a bit of it into the school environment and in our classrooms, I'm here to tell you, you will not be disappointed. Play will deliver back. Play is serious business, and play matters. So I'm going to field a couple questions. I think there's some questions out there. So just a second, and I'm going to grab a, oh, wonderful. How can adults stimulate our play? Great question. How can adults stimulate their play muscle? So one of the things is really basic. Think about your favorite form of play as a child. What got you excited? What tickled your brain? What lit you up? What sparked you? Find a way to stay connected to that. Was it science? Was it math? Was it art? Was it dance? Was it music? What was that thing? I'm here to tell you it's still inside you. Maybe you've allowed it to atrophy and get weak. But you can stimulate it again by finding moments, actually making appointments for yourself for your play. Do not think that play is not serious. See, the more that you're sparked and inspired and excited, you're going to bring that to the classroom, to your school environment, to the staff. So what's your play? I'll raise that question again. And that's going to be the way that you can stimulate your own play muscle, your own creative muscle, is knowing what I like to do, what sparks me. So finding that tapping back into that, making sure that it's always close by and it's always a resource, I think is a really important exercise for everyone to do, is your own play audit, basically. Audit your play. Think about what's important to me. But ask your students the same thing. What's your favorite game? What do you like to do? What tickles your brain? What gets you excited about getting up every morning? Why do you get out of bed? Those kinds of questions, I think, would be great because that's at the root of someone's inspiration. The more that we know about what inspires you, then I can feed that again and again and again. And then school becomes this amazing destination where I know I'm going to be nurtured and celebrated and uplifted and absolutely be challenged. Because that's the other role of our education community, is to challenge young people to maximize their potential. But they first have to know what inspires them, what gets them up in the morning, and why they want to come. But if you can't answer that question, it's going to be a challenge, isn't it? You have to know why. You come every day, what inspires you and what you want to be a part of. So that's where the way I think you could stimulate your play muscle is ask the question and answer, what's my play? What inspires me? What do I want to be around? But then how do I get my students to be inspired? I think we got another question. Kevin, are you coming to the national conference? Yes, I am. I will be at the national conference. I will be celebrating that with all of you, but even more so, I'm excited that we're going to, this is a great segue. You had no idea whoever asked this question. We're going to actually be doing a film screening about play, about play all over the world. And it's actually based off of this book, The Ball, by John Fox. So what's exciting is they made a film called Bounce, how the ball taught the world how to play. And he's an anthropologist who went around the world actually discovering and researching the origin of ball games around the world and why we play ball. 
why a ball matters to us. So I'm going to show you this quick trailer about bounce, but we're going to be doing a film screening. You'll get more details about that. It's an exciting moment, but watch this trailer. Imagine you've spent millennia as humanity kicking pebbles and skulls and something bounces. Oh my God. What did you think? So I have to tell you, there's some really wonderful little backstories and connections to that. So Bounce, at the very end, you saw the bonobos playing with the soccer ball. I actually donated those to the effort. I'm an advisor on that film. But how magical was that, that they're playing with the ball, but if you look in the background, there is a young bonobo mirroring the adult. The adult is playing, and the young bonobo is already starting to model that behavior. They do what they see. If you bring energy, if you bring positivity, if you bring a playful spirit, inspiration, passion, purpose, intention, your students will reflect you. They'll reflect that whole school environment. I think that's so important that we all stop and think about that, that our energy is a direct reflection in our students. So the more that we bring that energy, that playfulness, that spark, that passion, that purpose, that intention, Anything truly is possible, they'll feed off of you. I got another question. My school is leaping into STEM. Can you offer STEM and play integration strat? Oh, I can offer STEM a play integration. Why don't you make that STEAM, put the A in there, the arts and activity, right? So rather than STEM, it's the arts and activity, movement, what? Magic. Boom, I'm telling you, it's done. STEAM rather than STEM. And now you've got activity in the arts attached to that because I think we're looking at the holistic approach, right? Look, science, technology, engineering, math, I get that. I know that's important. Absolutely, right? And we need to be nurturing that next generation of individuals who will be involved in those industries. But also, those individuals should never forget about their activities, movement, and the arts, right? Things that spark them, things that are about inspiration, things that are about their play. So if we can always be attaching that A, activity in the arts, to STEM, I think we all win. That's the magic ingredient. I think that's the piece that's going to absolutely tip that. Speaking of which, I did forget one story. So if you follow me over here, I'm going to share this last little story. And it is one of the most magical stories. So the queen of Katwe, Fiona Mutesi. I got to interview her three times on our radio show here in town in Portland. And she has now this story of a young girl growing up in Kampala, Uganda, outside in the slums, actually, beyond the city of Kampala, is now, her story has been optioned by Disney and be releasing this summer. We got one of the first exclusive interviews with her. She enjoyed the energy so much she came back. So imagine that you're living in squalor. Just deplorable, hard scrabble situation. You're a young lady. You're not really sure what you're going to do with your life. You haven't been able to go to school because your family can't afford it. You're hungry. You're walking the streets. There's a gentleman, Robert Katende, who actually works through an organization called Sports Outreach. He sees that a lot of the young people are too weak because they haven't been eating on a regular basis to play soccer. So he has to find an activity for them. He chooses chess. 
he starts to create these moments where children can come and play chess and get a meal. Repeat and repeat and repeat. Fiona hears about this opportunity. She comes to the location that Robert has created. There's chess boards laid out and there's food. Fiona refuses to play, but she'd like to eat. Robert lets her eat. She comes back a second time, a third time. Finally, Robert says, you're going to have to play. You have to play, and then I'll give you food. Fiona sits down at the table across from Robert. Robert moves a piece. Fiona moves a piece. Robert moves another piece. Fiona moves another piece. Robert says, have you played before? She says, no, I've just been watching you all. Fiona has a gift. She becomes a chess champion. She's raised her family up beyond the squalor and the hard scrabble life. And now her story will be a Disney story. It'll be amazing individuals that'll be sharing in that. Lupita Nyong'o is going to be a part of it. She's actually going to play Fiona's mother. But Fiona enjoyed our conversations and my energy and my enthusiasm about her story. She gifted me something. She gifted me, actually, one of her chess sets. This is going to fall, and I apologize, but this is actually one of her chess sets from Uganda, one of the ones that she learned off of. And the pieces, and this is actually bagged in the bag that she would get her meal from. So I want you all to stop and think about, once again, if you think play doesn't matter, if you think activity doesn't matter, I'm here to push back hard. I'm here to tell you that Fiona doesn't have the success and the opportunity to change her circumstances without activity and play. I don't have that opportunity. All the individuals that are going to be affected by those global game changers won't get those opportunities unless someone identifies that play is serious business and we don't marginalize it, we celebrate it. I'll say it once again, we are awaiting you to lift your game, to raise your game, to be a play catalyst, to be a play global game changer, to be that individual or organization, staff, community that's going to affect the next generation of leaders, makers, doers, and dreamers. Can I count on you? Will you raise your game? I'm telling you that I'm awaiting your arrival as the next generation. Tell your students that Kevin Carroll, KC the Catalyst, said hello, but even more so, I have an expectation that you're going to raise your game, that you're going to find a way, that you're not going to allow your circumstances to dictate your destiny. I know it's possible. I stand before you living proof, and I've witnessed it all over the world. Their circumstances do not have to dictate an individual's outcome. Success awaits you, but even more so, significance is the thing that we're pursuing. So I'm going to be dropping off for all of you a few resources, a wonderful PDF about play as a competitive advantage. I'm going to be sharing the Playworks playbook with over 300 games. I'm also going to be sharing with you some other resources, but even more so, be on the lookout. If you're coming to the national conference, I'm going to be there for that bounce screening. And we'll have a conversation, a panel, all these different things that are going on. If you have some questions that didn't come up or we didn't get a chance to get to your questions, send them in and we'll actually be able to maybe answer those post. And we're thinking about some other ways to shift or advance the, the I guess, the interaction, the experience for these webinars. So if you have any ideas, please share those with us because we want this to be about you. I want to share and exhaust all my resources, my time, my energy, and my thoughts. So that's my end game with all of you, is to give you as much as possible. So if you all are game, if you're willing to support and believe and celebrate your own play, then I have one thing to leave you with. Game on, play on, peace and play, catalyst out.